This channel is part of the History Hit Network. Stick around to find out more. When over 20 of Egypt's finest temples were threatened by flooding, 51 nations came to the rescue and mounted one of the most ambitious structural moves in history. Moving the 3,000-year-old temples on this World Heritage Site stretched men and machines to the limit. We're talking about a huge temple. Think of Mount Rushmore but even more. Today, a team of modern movers demonstrate the monumental effort needed to rescue Ramesses. The dangers and difficulties they face mirror those of the people who dared to do the ultimate monster move. The colossal temples of Abu Simbel sit on the shores of the River Nile in southern Egypt. They were built by the mighty pharaoh Ramesses II, whose reign lasted 67 years. His architects and engineers bestowed the great temple with a special power. They carefully aligned its sacred entrance so that twice a year the sun's rays would penetrate the deep inner sanctuary to light up the faces of the gods inside. For over 3,000 years, this extraordinary spectacle has occurred on the same two dates every year, the 22nd of February and the 22nd of October, and attracts thousands of visitors. But in the 1960s, many feared this sunlight phenomenon would never be seen again. Abu Simbel was under threat by the very geographical feature that had enabled the ancient kingdom to flourish, the River Nile. Without the Nile, Egypt is not Egypt. It would be a complete desert. So if the Egyptians say to you that the Nile is our artery of life, this is, this is an absolute fact, because there is no other real source of water except the Nile. The Egyptian government had to harness the power of the Nile by building the Aswan High Dam. This massive structure, almost four kilometers long, would eventually create a reservoir stretching for 500 kilometers and provide enough electricity to power half of Egypt. Now, to build the dam is great for Egypt and the Egyptians, to see for, for the agricultural land, for electricity, for energy, and so on. But there is always a drawback. The drawback was that the resulting lake would flood the site of over 20 ancient monuments. The largest and most important were those at Abu Simbel. We're talking about a huge temple. Think of Mount Rushmore, but even more, because Mount Rushmore is only the statues. Here we have a complete edifice. Ramesses II built this temple as a statement so that people would think twice, especially those that would attack the Egyptian borders, either from the deserts on both sides or from, from the south. The imposing facade of Abu Simbel's main temple is 33 meters high. Hidden behind the entrance are a series of holes and chambers that run deep into the heart of the mountain. Statues and pillars line each of the hallways, with hieroglyphics adorning every wall. The floors rise up towards the most important room in the temple, the inner sanctuary, that contains the statue of Ramesses, seated alongside three powerful gods. It is along this narrow hallway that twice a year, a shaft of sunlight illuminates three of the figures, while the fourth, the god of the underworld, remains in total darkness. Preserving this unique spectacle would be the engineer's toughest challenge. But there was a more pressing problem. Unless they took immediate action, the temple was doomed to underwater oblivion. The Egyptian government sent out an urgent plea to the United Nations to help save the temples. History hit 
is a streaming platform that is just for history fans, with fantastic documentaries covering fascinating figures and moments in history from all over the world. With documentaries uncovering the secrets of our earliest ancestors to the enduring mystery of Rome's lost Ninth Legion, History Hit has hundreds of documentaries with unrivaled access to the world's best historians. Not only that, but we have a huge podcast network releasing new episodes every day, so you'll always have something to listen to. Sign up now for a 14-day free trial, and Odyssey fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code ODYSSEY at checkout. In March 1960, a stirring appeal for international solidarity was launched during a special ceremony at UNESCO. Monuments of universal importance have a right to universal protection. As you can imagine, when the project was launched all over the world, it fired the imaginations of the engineers, the architects, even sometimes cranks that wanted to have their name tied up to this because they want to do something. And we had different projects or different ideas. Experts from over 50 nations put their heads together to find the best way to save the temples. The most daunting challenge was Abu Simbel's mountain setting. One idea was to allow Abu Simbel to flood and construct a kind of colossal aquarium. They would build a dome around the site. Pumps inside the walls would filter the muddy Nile to maintain the visibility of the water. Observation galleries would allow spectators above to peer down onto the submerged monument. To get a closer view, elevators would shuttle visitors underwater. The biggest problem with this plan was that the temples are carved in sandstone, which is very porous. Over time, water would eventually erode the stone, causing the temples to crumble. They began to realize the only way to save the temples was to move them. Engineers calculated that the flooding of the dam would raise water levels by 60 meters. To guarantee their safety, the temples would have to be raised by at least 65 meters and moved 200 meters inland. It seemed like an almost impossible problem. The difficulty with moving Abu Simbel is that you have a huge cliff above the uh, temple itself, extending 60 meters back into the rock. So a huge footprint, and to attempt to mo move all of that in one piece is, uh, is a major exercise. One option was to raise the temples up to the new site in one piece. Movers would need to cut around the entire monument to free it from the mountain. Underneath, they would install 650 hydraulic jacks. Lifting in unison, the jacks would gradually raise a quarter of a million tons, a millimeter at a time. Once fully extended, they would replace the jacks with concrete pillars. These would then form a platform under the structure so the jacks could be reset and lift the great temple to the next level. They would need to repeat this 200 times. The risk was enormous. Nothing this heavy had ever been moved before. If any jacks or pillars failed, the result could be catastrophic. The difficulty of moving the temple en masse would have been hugely complex. And you're lifting something which weighs 250,000 tons. Uh, I'm sure that in, the, in 1964 would have been a groundbreaker, literally. There was another way. Using the rising water level to their advantage, movers proposed encasing the temple inside an immense concrete barge. Then as the water level rose, the temple would be floated to safety. A brilliant idea but it would take over six years for the waters to raise the heavy load to its new location. And there was a serious risk. In the event of a storm, the temples might be damaged. Engineers began to realize Abu Simbel was simply too heavy to move en masse. The only practical way was the least appealing, to cut the temples up into small sections for the big move. This idea horrified archeologists. Cutting a monument is a very, very tough thing to accept. But you had to take this with that, you know, the bitter with the sweet. 
This was the safest one. You are absolutely sure that nothing is going to be lost. You are getting it away from the water. It's going to be on terra firma. In early 1964, an international team of 2,000 engineers and contractors from Sweden, Italy, France, Germany, and Egypt began the monumental task of dismantling Abu Simbel. The heaviest and most precious blocks to be rescued at Abu Simbel were the heads of Ramesses weighing 30 tons and carved almost 20 meters up into the mountain itself. Monster Moves commissioned local stonemasons to carve a replica, but the biggest block of sandstone a modern quarry could provide was only one third of the size, 10 tons. Using this replica, a team of modern day movers will demonstrate how Ramesses' temples were rescued. Heading the team are house movers Jerry Matiko and his son Gabe. But they're more accustomed to dealing with colonial homes than Pharaoh's heads. Hello, Cairo. Where is this thing? Whoa, look there. <laughs> All right. It looks like the head popped looks out of a, a, a molehill. Coming out of the ground. Oh, that's pretty funny. That's wild. Great piece. Are you the sculptor? <laughs> nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yeah, good job. And did you have like electric hammers that you took Air away? Air chisel? The, or did you use it all by hand? Chisel only. Chisel only. Chisel only, yes. The hammer and the chisel? Yes, yes. Not the air chisel. No, no, no. no. <laughs> chisel only. That's yeah. pretty funny. That's great. Wow. They are joined by engineer Richard Swift, who specializes in conserving historic buildings. What are your, what are your thoughts? You've been here looking at this thing longer than we have. Well, the... The concern is whether we lose the ear if we try and cut behind the ear. Yeah. The final team member is British stonemason Johnny Anderson, whose usual work is restoring cathedrals. We have a tower here. One, two, three, four, on all four corners. It may only be a replica, but the team will treat it like a real artifact. It's a real thing. It's real sandstone. The guys carved it for real. and uh... We're in Egypt. They're Egyptian. I mean, it doesn't get any more real than that, I don't think. <laughs> Our modern movers will demonstrate the three key stages of the rescue, cutting, lifting, and reassembling, using the same tools and techniques as the engineers in the 1960s. So we cut it perpendicular here, and then horizontal at the shoulders. Do we have to dig down to get the shoulders? <laughs> Back in the 60s, engineers realized they couldn't cut Abu Simbel into equal-sized blocks, as this would leave the facade looking like a chessboard. A cut line through a nose or eye could cause irreparable scars. So they tailored each cut to minimize the damage. And it wasn't just the facade that needed cutting. The rooms of the temple inside the mountain, their columns, ceilings, and hieroglyphic walls also needed severing. They would need to make over 5,000 cuts to slice the mountain temple into 1,050 movable blocks. The original Abu Simbel temple was carved into the mountain, a naturally occurring structure. The problem for the engineers and contractors was how to move not only the temple, but the whole of the mountain. Within six months, the flooding Nile would be lapping at Ramesses' feet. To buy themselves more time, the engineers built a temporary barrier called a coffer dam to hold back the water. But this coffer dam would only give them an extra 13 months before water was likely to start pouring over the top. So they could see that they were working and there is some kind of tsunami coming towards them. Yes, of course, they built the coffer dam. But how long can that coffer dam hold the water? 
how long it would last, what kind of pressure it would have been under. So all the time, the poor things were working, and they, was, uh, they were under this constant pressure. We must finish, otherwise, either the temple or the deluge. Before they could reach the underground temples, the engineers needed to move the mountain of rock resting on top. The quickest way of moving 330,000 tons of rock is to use explosives, but they feared the shock waves would damage the temples. Instead, they had to slice the mountain using steel wire and chainsaws. It took 500 men seven months to remove the entire mountaintop. Only then could they start work on the temple. To avoid a chainsaw massacre, the pharaoh's heads were given special treatment before their facelifts. First, they covered each cut line with protective bandages to stop the sandstone edges from crumbling when sliced. Our team today will do exactly the same. Get down the bottom. Yeah, that's it. That's, that's good. there. It gives you an idea of where you got to be. Yeah, that's good. Even though it dries, it'll dry. It'll dry rigid enough for it to hold the stone, to stop the stone from being damaged as we make the cut. It, uh, it when you add water to it again, it washes off. The head must not be left with unsightly scars. So instead of chainsaws, our team will use long hand saws, just as they did at Abu Simbel, to ensure that each visible cut is less than eight millimeters thick. We need to go that way a quarter of an inch. It's crucial that they make the first cut in the right place at the right angle, or they risk cracking the face. We're trying to get this lined up with the other side, and then we've got a, a guide here with a board nail on the inside. The handles are this far out. The board's the same uh, width from our guide. <clears throat> so we get both of these lined up, we can get started. Just like the workers at Abu Simbel 40 years ago, they know that one wrong move and Ramesses' head could be reduced to rubble. All right, uh, you want to start towards me? If you like. Yes? Yeah. Whoa. The total length of cuts for the Abu Simbel temples reached almost 10 kilometers. It took nine months of continuous back-breaking sawing to dismantle the temples. It's much harder than they ever imagined, and our team struggles to make any impact on the sandstone head. Yeah, I was gonna do that earlier, but I figured we'd keep going. Wow. You can see in the middle of the blade here, only, only after sawing for sh this short amount of time, that uh, we've lost uh, an eighth of an inch uh, off, the, off, the, off of the teeth, and they've they flattened right off, and this thing needs resharpening already. The saws must be constantly sharpened to ensure a clean cut. The scale of the operation at Abu Simbel was unprecedented. For young Swedish engineer Juste Persson, it would be the challenge of a lifetime. Over 40 years ago, Juste was a key member of the original team that set out to pull off this amazing feat. It's really fascinating to come back to Abu Simbel and see what it looked like. This is his first trip back since 1966. Amazing. It's fantastic. It's really fantastic. If you don't know about what has happened here, you can never imagine. It could very well have been here from the beginning. But it's good. It's really good. 
When Yusta faced the enormous edifice of Abu Simbel 40 years ago, cutting the facade was only the beginning. The inner temples, ceilings, and walls all had to be cut into movable blocks and reassembled. I'm trying to find out if you can see any cuts in the roof. So far, I haven't found them, but must be possible. Yeah, oh. here is definitely one coming from there and going straight over here. And there we meet another one in the other direction. All these beautifully painted walls and ceilings had to be painstakingly cut by hand. It was definitely more difficult to tell, more, more tricky to find suitable locations of the cut in order not to disturb all these valuable paintings. That was more tricky. You could say we were trying to move a mountain, but we had to do it in pieces. <laughs> we couldn't take all, the whole mountain in one piece. In fact, Abu Simbel needed to be cut into over a thousand blocks, each weighing up to 30 tons. But as well as Abu Simbel, there were more than 18 other sacred monuments that needed to be rescued. The Temple of Kalabsha was one of them. Built during the reign of the Roman Emperor Augustus, Kalabsha was already constructed from blocks rather than being carved out of a mountain. It would provide the perfect opportunity to test the techniques needed to safely move and reassemble Abu Simbel. The only problem was that for most of the year, Kalabsha was prone to the seasonal flooding of the Nile, so it was impractical to use traditional moving methods. They had to come up with a different solution. The first temple to be dismantled was the Temple of Kalabsha, which was underwater for nine months of the year. And so the Germans tackled this problem by working with the falling water. Rather than try to beat the floods, the German engineering team decided to make use of the changing water levels. They waited until the waters were at their highest and brought in barges to dismantle and move the blocks 50 kilometers to safety. They worked down from the top, layer by layer, as the water level dropped. To move 16,000 blocks in a very short time scale was a very tight program and a very difficult task to undertake, but it was achieved very successfully, and that gave a great deal of confidence for the moving of Abu Simbel. But actually slicing Abu Simbel into pieces was an incredibly tough challenge. As our team is discovering, cutting through sandstone is surprisingly hard. After two hours of back-breaking work, they have only gone 50 centimeters. It's still early doors yet, but uh, it's, it's, it's getting hot. It's going to be fun after lunch. Cutting is, is pretty hard, yeah. I mean, I think, I think Johnny and I both knew when we've looked at the blades that they gave us that it wasn't going to be exactly, exactly uh, you know, a smooth operation. But um, I don't know how many people they had to do the, Ab the Abu Simbel project. But um, it's almost embarrassing, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It was just a shame, really. <laughs> We're moaning about this job, you know. <laughs> and it's one cut in one piece, so... How are you going to do it? I wouldn't fancy doing two. <laughs> I just hope we get it done today. Hush, yeah, that hey, yeah, I'm right. Get him going. As our movers struggle with the replica of Ramesses' head, they're beginning to realize what a relentlessly grueling task the engineers faced 40 years ago. Now, yeah, this is uh, pretty much shot. This saw, uh, it's been used quite a bit. You can see where it's been worn in the center. And uh, we've labeled them. Some of these saws cut better than the others. So you want to grab the one that's uh, cutting better when you jump up to the line. This one's called Hassan. With 10 kilometers of cuts to be made before the temples of Abu Simbel flooded, sawing could never stop. 500 men worked in shifts, day and night. Our team is also working in shifts with a group of Egyptian stonemasons. You good man, you. You yourself. English, no? English, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Two thousand workers and their families from five different countries came to Abu Simbel. A specially built town sprung up in the surrounding desert to accommodate the expanding workforce. Soon there were houses, cafes and hotels. It was a melting pot of nationalities with one common objective, to save the 3,000-year-old temples of Abu Simbel. Everyone had their work to do. And whether they spoke Italian or German or English or French or Arabic, doesn't matter. You could always point at such things which you wanted to have done. It's mid-afternoon. And after six hours sawing, our team has still only cut halfway through. And now they are struggling with a new snag. We've got a, we've got a bit of a problem. So the, some oil's been put on one of the saws when they got it sharpened. Maybe somebody thought it was a good idea to to help, uh, help, help it through the cut. But uh, the only thing that will do is um, a, damage the stone, uh, stain it, and B, clog the cut up. Johnny decides what they must do is clear the oily residue from between Ramesses' ears using giant dental floss. We're using this string, which is working rather well. Hang on a minute, Gabe. This is our oil-laden dust that's been... It's really... You can see how sticky it is. And, Dry, sawn sandstone doesn't go like that. After a successful flossing, the cutting continues. But as the cut becomes deeper, they have a new concern, that the top half of the face may split away from the head. They put a safety prop in place before resuming work. Eight and a half hours at it now, and uh, with all the problems we've had this afternoon with the oil um, and, the, and the sharpening of the blades, um, it's uh, slowed us right up. Finally, after 12 hours, the team make it through. Bruce. Hey. It took 500 workers over nine months to complete all the cuts at Abu Simbel. Their next challenge was to move and reassemble the ancient temples. The international team of 2,000 engineers and contractors assembled at Abu Simbel were racing to beat the rising Nile in the most ambitious move of a historical site ever attempted. Eighty kilometers further upriver, a French engineering team was trying to save the oldest monument on the rescue list, the Temple of Amada. One of the most important and one of the oldest temples, and the problems there was that the temple was already suffering from distress. Beautiful wall paintings on the interior, so it was not possible to take it and cut it into bits and move it block by block. <laughs> If the movers attempted to dismantle or cut this temple, there was a real risk that the walls would be damaged. The best solution was to devise a way of moving the temple intact as a single unit. To strengthen the temple for its journey, engineers braced the temple's crumbling corners and wrapped the walls with high-tension steel cables. They threaded concrete beams underneath the floor to support this 900-ton monument for the big lift. In an extraordinary operation, not unlike the great engineering feats of the ancient Egyptians, hundreds of workers built a set of railway tracks to transport the temple across the uneven desert. Except that instead of using manpower to pull the temple, they used hydraulic jacks to push it. 
The location was so remote, they could only ship in 150 meters of track. So they leapfrogged the track, choosing a zigzag route that dodged the mounds and dunes. That's what the ancient Egyptians did. To remove blocks, they would have logs, and they would, uh, like runners, and they would have the log, and the one that's finished at the end, they just uh, jumps in the front. Moving at a rate of less than 25 meters a day, this epic two and a half kilometer journey took three months to complete. Amada was small enough to be moved in one complete piece. But back at Abu Simbel, they were still cutting the site into large blocks. Next, they had to work out how to lift each block without damaging it. Our team will show us how it was done in the second stage of their demonstration as they attempt to lift the pharaoh's face. So I've just been sketching up and trying to work out roughly where the, the centroid will be for the fixings. One way of lifting the face was to use straps. But threading them under such a heavy weight would not be easy. And there was a real risk the straps might cut into the face. To solve the problem, engineers devised an ingenious way of using two metal rods that would act like cocktail sticks picking up cheese. The big question was how far in they should drill the rods. If they didn't go far enough, natural cracks in the rock might open up, with disastrous results. Having drilled the holes, our team are ready to cement the rods into place using grout, but this is a challenge in the desert heat. The problem with using water in grouts is that uh, the temperature rises so dramatically. So we're using ice here in the water to try and keep that temperature down, as they would have done in 1964. We only have a certain amount of time to, to, to handle this grout before it sets up. Um, you know, it's real hot, we're in the desert, it's really dry. Um, so we put it into the, the pressure machine, we pressure it up so that we have enough uh, force to shove the grout down these tubes, into the sock, up the rod, and, and up against the side of the hole so we get some really good uh, cohesion so that adhesive can stick. <laughs> After six hours, the grout has set, and the time has come for the second stage of the demonstration, the lift. What is this sign for up and down? Before they begin, Jerry makes sure that his American hand signals translate into Arabic. We want to speak the same language as a boom up. Boom down. This way, that way. Straight up, a little bit, straight up. Oh, wait a minute, what's this? Uh, this is a little bit. Oh, that's a little, a little bit. Uh, that's a little bit. Yeah, little up bit. a little bit. Like, huh? like tell you blonde hair. <laughs> like so blonde hair. OK, and what's this one? Uh, no, nothing. Oh, just, just the hair? Just the hair, yeah. I don't have no hair. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Yeah. Before they lift the face too high, they must make sure the lifting bars are secure enough to take the weight. Whoa! That's plenty, that is plenty. Whoa, 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 whoa! Just no more, that's it, we're good. We're good, no more, we don't need any more. No, 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 you're on the corner. Just don't pull him out. Don't pull him out. The rods appear to be holding. But Johnny is worried they're lifting so fast that the face might crash into the back of the head. We're not doing any more lifting on this block. This block stays where it is, that's it. What's it? Okay. It's there into, there into the big moves now. Jerry has other ideas. He's ready to lift. Abu Simbel, October the 10th, 1965. A tense moment for the engineers as they lift the first face. They have 3,000 years of history hanging in the balance.
They loaded Ramesses' face onto a truck, cushioned inside a support frame. They carried out this procedure over a thousand times for each block. The truck had to move very slowly on its 800-meter journey to a storage area to protect the fragile sandstone from vibrations. One by one, they slowly carried the blocks around the mountain until everything was ready for reassembly on the new site on higher ground above the water. In the central storage yard, the blocks were carefully catalogued and filed like books in a library. Each block was given an identification code so they knew exactly where it had come from and in which order it would be put back together. It was a strict system with no room for error. In April 1966, the last pieces of Abu Simbel, the pharaoh's enormous feet, were moved. The engineers had beaten the rising tide and moved the temples in time. Four months later, water surged over the top of the cofferdam and flooded the site. But the most daunting task still lay ahead. They had to reassemble every piece so that the sun's rays would shine on the gods once more. The race to save the other temples continued. The last to be rescued were on the island of Philae, which was already disappearing underwater. Philae was once the center of worship for the goddess Isis and the focus of ancient pilgrimages. It was now in danger of being lost forever. To save these sacred temples, engineers built a temporary barrier around the site to hold back the Nile. After pumping out the water from inside the barrier, movers could dismantle the buildings without getting their feet wet. Unfortunately, it was not large enough to encircle all the monuments. Some of the island's sacred structures still lay completely submerged outside. This included the Roman gateway to the island, the Diocletian Gates. To rescue these from the bottom of the lake required a different strategy. British Royal Navy divers were called in to help. The leader of the team was Lieutenant Commander Thompson. We started off last October by, recovering, by removing the mud in which the, the gate was buried. It was the biggest challenge in Lieutenant Commander Ed Thompson's career. Now aged 75, he's returning for the first time since his underwater rescue. Ah, oh, now wait a minute. That's it. That's the gate. And that's more or less the way it was when I saw it underwater. Well, of course, when we first arrived, the whole thing, almost the whole thing, say 99% of it, was coated in mud except a little bit of space underneath what I called it. I think that was the southern arch as I had it. And the first thought, thought I had was, how the heck am I going to get rid of the mud? They broke up the mud using a high-pressure hose called an air lance, then sucked it up through a pipe, like an underwater vacuum cleaner. Most things had to be done by touch because of the bad visibility underwater. Therefore, you had 10 eyes here, five there and five there. And these two weren't used a great deal. Beneath the water, Ed's team broke the structure apart with nothing more sophisticated than a hammer and chisel. But how do you then raise a half-ton solid stone block to the surface? Their solution was to use canvas lifting bags. By inflating them with air like balloons, they had enough buoyancy to pull the blocks to the surface. The low visibility and long hours made this a dangerous operation. Over six months, 450 blocks of the Diocletian gates were floated to the surface one by one, where they were picked up by crane and taken away to their new location. I never thought I would see the thing erected again. I wasn't quite sure when I arrived here if I was going to look at the thing and find it upside down. But I don't think it is, is it? By January 1966, work reassembling Abu Simbel at its new site had begun. 
As well as putting the monument back together, the team faced the even bigger task of rebuilding the mountain around the temples. The volume of stonework that would have had to have been applied to the top of the uh, roof slab of the temple would be something like 300,000 cubic meters of stonework, a ridiculous amount of stone in a very short space of time. Reassembling an entire mountain on top of the temples in their new position was an immense challenge. Piling truckloads of rock on top of the temples would be the easiest way, but this would crush the monuments. The engineers needed to replicate the precise scientific properties of the original mountain that had acted like an arch to hold the weight of rock away from the ancient temple. Their solution was to build an enormous concrete dome over the temple. The dome was so large, it had to be built using 300 giant interlocking concrete sections. The dome would bear the full weight of mountain rock piled on top, protecting the temples below. The front of the cliff face would be reinstated block by block, to ensure the temple and its surroundings looked as if they had never been moved. Two huge hurdles remained. Could they orientate the great temple as precisely as the ancients for the sunrise to illuminate the gods inside? And could the giant statues of Ramesses II be pieced back together to guard the temples once more? The team attempting to move the replica head of Ramesses have reached the final stage of their demonstration. Are you ready, George? They've sliced and lifted the face off. Now they must confront the same challenge faced by engineers back in the 60s when they reassembled the great temple of Abu Simbel. They needed to find a foolproof way of securing the face to the head, otherwise it would plummet 20 meters to the ground below. Cement was the obvious way, but they were worried the bond might be too weak for such a massive weight. There was a real risk Ramesses could fall flat on his face. They came up with an ingenious solution. They attached an L-shaped counterweight to the rear of the face using steel rods. The purpose of the concrete key is to act as a fixing for the sandstone face back into the rock face. Obviously, you can't put any fixings through the face to secure it. Uh, otherwise, you'd destroy the archaeology. So the reinforced concrete key is fitted into the sandstone by these fixing rods, which you can see here. The snug fitting of the wedge shape into the head would make the face impossible to dislodge. But have our team's calculations paid off? Can they successfully reassemble Ramesses' face back into his head? Our team is wrestling to fit Ramesses' face back into his head to complete the third and final stage of reassembling their record. It's a difficult task, made even harder by the desert winds. No closer! I want to go up! They're worried the L-shaped wedge could swing into their head and damage it. Rich, get that back row. Jerry can't do two at once. Yeah. All right, we want to come down now? Very, very slow. Oh, she's can you go, it. can you go, can you go redder? That way, that way. Well, I can, I can, I can, I can talk to him, Johnny. Okay, right, you gotta watch the front okay. way. You probably need to boom down a little bit. She's moving down then. Whoa, 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 whoa. Tell the queen to do it. Okay, right, we're gonna drop it. We're gonna take, and take it close to that edge. Got probably two inches, three inches on my side. You need that? I'm really tight on my side here. Okay. All right. You okay? Yeah, good. Yeah, you're about an inch and a half away from your cut. Coming down with it. That's it, baby. We're good. We're good. We're there. Let's come on, put him in. That's there. it right there. Done. There you go. One, we two, three. It. Ramesses. Hey. 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 Ha, ha, ha.
The original move involved hundreds of delicate operations like this. It took an exhausting 19 months to completely reassemble the temples. Then they had to disguise their handiwork. There were 10 kilometers of cuts between the temple blocks that all needed to be filled with mortar to cover up any signs of surgery. On the 31st of October, 1968, four and a half years after it had begun, and an astonishing 20 months ahead of schedule, the project was completed. Just as everyone had hoped, Abu Simbel was not only restored to its former glory, it looked as if the temples had never been moved. Ramesses II must have been absolutely happy with this project. Seeing the whole world coming to save one of his monuments, and to save it not only for the time being, but for posterity, and all these thousands and thousands and millions of tourists that would come, they don't even mention, they don't only mention the Temple of Ramesses II, but the project that got the whole world together to save the monument. They were clever 3,000 years back. They carved this out of the rock. We were not so bad either when we moved them. Finally, the engineers faced the ultimate moment of truth, when they would find out whether the great temple had been correctly realigned to still allow the sun to shine through to the inner sanctuary on those two days of the year. There can be no greater testimony to the triumph of this greatest of all moves. Today, the sun's rays still strike the faces of the three sacred statues, just as they have always done for 3,000 years and will do for centuries to come.